Hello, I am Minna Zalman Proctor, and I am pleased to welcome you to the 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival Digital Edition. We're joined today by the authors Alain Mabancou, Adania oh. Shipley, and Juan Pablo Villalobos. I want to thank the festival for inviting me to moderate this panel and giving me the opportunity to engage with these wonderful books <laughs> and their authors. Um, before we get any further, I, am, uh, I would like to remind our audience that the books by these authors in this program can be purchased in the link below. So today we are celebrating three remarkable and extremely different books. They run the gamut from hilarity to tragedy, are set in Palestine, Barcelona, the People's Republic of Congo, are written originally in Arabic, Spanish, and French, set in 1949, 1977, and this day. I've spent the better part of this past week trying to identify common aspects and the better part of that time distinguishing the unique literary mastery of each of our guests. Like all great artists, they are more different than they are the same. But our panel is entitled Ripples of Violence, Personal and Literary, suggesting that the commonality we're meant to be tracing here is the lingering impact of violence, violent politics, violent history, and a culture of violence. And what's lovely about that premise is that each of our authors presents their own utterly nuanced versions of violence, and none of it is exactly what you'd expect. In the death of Comrade President, Alain Mabancou's <coughs> latest book to be translated into English, in this case by Helen Stevenson, a young teenage boy narrates the events surrounding the assassination of Marianne Ngubi, socialist military dictator of the People's Republic of Congo in 1977. Michelle is a passionate, often inadvertently funny and innocent narrator who is trying to work out the implications of the military coup and subsequent regime change for his family. In his account, we see a child's dedication to his own indoctrination and familiar daily life, coming face to face with capricious and dangerous political realities. Adania Shibli's Minor Detail, translated by Elizabeth Jaquette, is a spare, chilling diptych, a novel in two parts. The first section takes place in an Israeli military outpost in the Negev Desert on the border of Egypt in 1949. The soldier's mission is to reinforce the border and cleanse it of remaining Arabs. They capture a Bedouin girl and assault, rape, and kill her, burying her significantly in the sand. The story is told through the dis dispassionate eyes of the captain, the rapist. The second part, set today, follows a writer from Ramallah who's come across the minor detail of the rape and murder in a newspaper story and is determined to find out more about it. Her search takes her through zones and across borders to a landscape scarred by its history, but stripped of answers. And Juan Pablo Villalobos, I Don't Expect Anyone to Believe Me, translated by Daniel Hahn, is the carnivalesque tale of a Mexican graduate student in literary theory named Juan Pablo, whose study abroad in Barcelona gets hijacked by an international drug and money laundering cartel. You know everything is going to end very badly when the crime lords force him to switch his dissertation topic from humor to gender studies, and then seduce a lesbian classmate. I asked each of the authors to read a very short section of their work, just so that we could um, hear its original music. Uh, so I will ask you to start now. Why don't we start with Juan Pablo? Because we ended there. Okay. Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the festival for the invitation and thank you, Mina, for being our host tonight and Nadania and Alain 
for sharing this <laughs> event. I'm very honored to be here with you. Good. And I will read a, a passage of, of, I don't expect anyone to believe me. And it's, it's, uh, it has four narrators, uh, four different narrators. And I have to say that it's kind of a parody of the autobiographical literature. I mean, one of the characters named Pan Pablo is writing a, an autobiographical novel. And then Valentina, his ex-girlfriend, is writing a, a diary. And Juan Pablo's mother and cousin are writing letters. So I will read from Juan Pablo, I mean, the, the, the autobiographical novel from one chapter that in English is called, I have been imagining a less conventional story. And it sounds in Spanish like this. Si quieres que crea que el proyecto puede funcionar, dice el mafioso mexicano, necesito una prueba. No confío en la gente que estudia tanto, que tiene tanto respeto por la teoría. Al final no hacen nada, dice. Se vuelven indecisos, contemplativos, escépticos. Y no hay nada peor para que un proyecto se vuelva realidad que tener un escéptico involucrado. Así que vas a dejar de pensar, dice. Y vas a obedecer, dice. ¿Entendido? El mexicano asiente moviendo ligeramente la cabeza, embobado por la presencia insólita del arma en su mano derecha. Mátalo, dice el mafioso mexicano. ¿Cómo? Dice el mexicano. Que le dispares, chingada, dice el mexicano. ¿A quién? ¿Cómo a quién, pendejo? ¿Cómo a quién? ¿A quién va a ser? Dice el mafioso mexicano. Tú lo metiste en esto, con tu brillante idea. Tú te haces responsable. Este, empieza a decir el mexicano, pero no se le ocurre nada más que decir. Thank you, thank you. Um, Adenia, why don't you read yours? Yeah, when, when you were mentioning, Mina, that this could be, or when also Juan Pablo was saying it's a parody, I hope it's my book. You were referring to my book, that is funny. <laughs> so I, I will be reading from the uh, second part, which you just described about the, uh, this lady, woman from Ramallah, and uh, nowadays it's, a, it's a, a section that talks about her kind of anxieties. على كل حال أدرك أن وصف الأمور قد يبدو مبالغا فيه لكن هذا يعود للمشكلة التي وصفتها للتو وهي عدم قدرتي على تمييز الحدود بما فيها المنطقية بين الأشياء ما يجعلني أغالي في تقييم أمر ما أو أن أقلل من شأنه مقارنة مع غالبية الناس مثلا حين توقف دورية عسكرية سيارة النقل العموم التي أستقلها إلى عمل الجديد وأول ما يطل عبرها بابها هو فوهة البندقية أطلب من الجندي بتلعثم على الأغلب بسبب الخوف أن يزيحها جانبا حين يتحدث إلي أو يطلب مني رؤية بطاقة هويته عندها عدا أن الجندي يروح يسخر من تلعثمي يبدأ من حولي من الركاب بالتأفف لأنني أبالغ فلا حاجة لخلق مثل هذا التوتر الجندي لن يطلق النار علي وإن حدث وفعل لن يغير تدخلي من مجرى الأمور بل العكس أجل إنني أفهم كل هذا ولكن ليس لحظتها إنما بعد ساعات أو أيام أو حتى سنين هذا على سبيل المثال Thank you Thank you Alain Yes, thank you So I'm going to read uh, maybe the, the first chapter from the death of uh, Comrade President in France of course. So the narrator, like you said, is like between 12 or 13, and he's seeing a lot of uh, things, political, and now he's, he's talking about his neighborhood, his mother, the neighbors, his father. So I'm gonna read just uh, that in French. Maman Pauline dit souvent que lorsqu'on sort, Il faut penser à mettre des habits propres car les gens critiquent en premier ce que nous portons. Le reste, on peut bien le cacher, par exemple, un caleçon gâté ou des chaussettes trouées. Je viens donc de changer de chemise et de short. Papa Roger est assis sous le manguier au bout de la parcelle, très occupé à écouter notre radio nationale. La voix de la révolution congolaise qui, depuis hier, Après-midi, ne passe que de la musique soviétique. 
sans se retourner, il me donne des consignes. « Michel, ne traîne pas sur ton chemin, n'oublie pas les courses de ta mère, mon vin rouge, mon tabac et ne perds pas la monnaie. » Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it's, so, it's so wonderful to hear, to hear the books. Um, and yes, um, Adenia, it's very funny. <laughs> all right, so I promise that I'll ask you about violence, but, um, yeah. but I, I can't help but start with language. Um, I was wondering if each of you could talk about the language or, or voice, if that's better, um, of your book. As you said, Juan Pablo, you have four different first persons and many different registers of Spanish. Alain, you use repetition or catchphrases for comic mm -hmm. effect. Your narrator himself comments on language and names that are hard to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> it's all done with so much warmth. I didn't, you have these startling micro-linguistic effects, especially in the first section where the sentences seem to hover. They just hover. I don't know who's <laughs> yeah. going to jump first. Still hovering. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Adenia, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the language that you thought about for both of these sections? Yes, oh, wow. I, I was hoping that you don't start with me because I am obsessed okay. with language. This is like okay. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> you want to go on, Alan? <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Well, uh, I mean, it's like now when reading, and you're, you're saying how beautiful it is, but how hard work it ha was writing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so language was specifically difficult in this case. I mean, I think with every work I, I have, like, or language appears in a different form, depending on the work itself. Uh, and sometimes even language and, and the relation to language already decides this type of, uh, of, of the content and even the shape. I mean, really, I, I feel sometimes like language is such a, uh, uh, an entity that it has so many shifts. Uh, and within these shifts, I think also fiction or writing itself changes. And in this case, it was um, basically the difficulty with language uh, that created this novel, uh, the difficulty of language and also the difficulty of narrating anything using language, uh, how language can, um, can withdraw from your life gradually, where you lose language, you lose uh, the words, uh, and becomes almost like a holes in memory, you know, when you have a certain experience, a violent experience, and, and often you come across something, and there's lots of kind of uh, foggy uh, spots. And basically language also in such situations uh, also embodies this fogginess. Suddenly it becomes foggy, words don't really emerge easily um, but then you think okay this is a specific experience with language if you are experiencing violence i mean or also the question how one would experience violence linguistically but also how the violators or those who are practicing violence can experience language uh, and for me, that was the whole relation with this novel, with these two chapters. Uh, and it's quite hard because, uh, you know, when you have these holes within language, how you can kind of ignore them and pretend there's another language, a language that is more uh, uh, flowing or moving or pretending not to be stuttering while you're the language that probably of the second part is the stuttering is the the one that experiencing violence and and in a way that you kind of try to position yourself in a place that is not the one who's experiencing the violence and not the one who's practicing violence and to have this relation with language interesting mm -hmm. how it's it's um it's as if you've 
found a prose version of erasure poetry um, to kind of address that subject of that you of violence and expressing it with language. It, there's a there's there's so much that's not not that's not there, but it's um, behind the words. Yes, it's actually, and it's. It, I think with um, I'm I'm kind of frightened when the word of poetry emerges because this is the form that I never write. I don't kind of feel <laughs> intimidated by the idea because it's very abstract poetry. It's like so conscious and so abstract, and in this case, there is absence and actually not writing uh, that are, are actually words not revealing themselves to you or to whoever uh, there in the face of this language. So it is, it's about like really kind of almost violent holes, like in a building, if a building is destroyed, like there's a whole gap, you know, in this building that, you know, you cannot, but you see through it. You, you, uh, if, if there's a, the building is destroyed, there's a big hole in the living room. You don't see the hole that covers the living room, but you see the inside of the living room. So what kind of language that is full of these holes, what is revealing, what is concealing in a way? In, in, in that sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Alain, you were. Yeah, I think that it was uh, said uh, deeply and profoundly. I come from Africa, so I've been speaking like for from now seven or eight languages from the Congo. So knowing that when I'm writing my novel, I'm writing it in French. It does mean that I'm still thinking everything through my own language. But my, like my mother language is not a language of conflict. We use it like uh, to calm down people. Usually when my father and my mother would like uh, get along, it was like my mother gonna speak on a language. So I often write with this, kind of mother language which is like peaceful so it's very con it's very conflictual to put it close to the french language in which i'm gonna find the war in which i'm gonna find colonization slavery everything which remind me of like my own situation so writing like like in france is it's for me a way of like putting inside that language my own african language so my character here is speaking french but i'm quite sure that if you listen too closely it's it's not gonna be the real french it's gonna be like uh, a french with a kind of congolese rhythm i need my character yes to speak in french but to keep in mind that they, re they remain uh, the only hero to keep my mother language. Would you, would you say, um, is this taking it too far to say in a way that when you're, you're writing in French, yeah. which is the language of colonial, colonialization, of conflict, yes. but mm -hmm. you, do you feel as if you're doing a kind of translation into French as you're writing, or you're, are you trying yeah. to find the I, French ver Are you doing a translation? Actually, actually, it's very quick. That translation is very quick because I can at the same time dream in French and in my uh, own African languages. So that translation is like you closing your eyes and opening it. So it's, it, it occurs very quickly. And sometimes that translation can be disturbed if, like in French, I don't find the word, the word to express what is in my own language. Then I'm gonna be stuck there thinking what I'm gonna do. Here I have a lot of problem. And maybe then I have to invent something in order to express myself. Juan Pablo, you have many Spanishes in your in your novel. Yeah, well, actually, hearing now Dania and Alain, I was thinking that maybe 
one thing in common is that these books started with a kind of a linguistic crisis. At least mine was, uh, was, was the, the product of a linguistic crisis. I have been living abroad for 17 years. I left Mexico in 2003. And in these 17 years, I lived 14 years in Barcelona, three years in Brazil. And uh, after I had like 10 years expatriate, I started to feel that the way I was speaking and writing in Spanish was not that Mexican. I mean, that I was losing, I was losing my Spanish. And I was living in Brazil by the time, and I had already written three novels, my, three, my, first, my first three novels, that they are very Mexican. Very Mexican, not just because they are placed in Mexico with Mexican characters and, and written in, in Mexican Spanish. Uh, I mean, all of them are is Mexico. But I started to feel that I was maybe starting to pretend to be Mexican. <laughs> that, that I mean, that I, I was not just a Mexican anymore. I was more than a Mexican. I mean, I was a Mexican married with a Brazilian, living in Barcelona, uh, speaking three languages every day. And even that my Spanish uh, had changed. I mean, the way I was speaking Spanish and I was hearing Alain talking about colonization. And yeah. I, I mean, we, we speak Spanish in Mexico and in Spain, but when, we, when, when you return to Mexico, for example, when I return to Mexico on holidays, and suddenly I'm, I'm talking with family or friends, and, and I make the mistake of saying a Spanish word, I mean, from the, from the Spanish of Spain, <laughs> uh, it's 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 like a betrayal you know mm -hmm. it's like what's that why are you talking like that i mean mm -hmm. uh it's like a treason and and so i with this novel i i felt that i needed to assume that i couldn't pretend to keep thinking that I was just a Mexican living in Mexico, that I was a Mexican writer living in Mexico, and that I had to assume my condition as an immigrant and the context that I was living in. So that's why in my novel, you have Argentinians, Catalans, mm -hmm. Italians, Chinese, Pakist Pakistanis, and all of them, they speak different kind of, of Spanishes. And, but this, is, this was the result, the product of a crisis. My next novel that I published in Spanish this year is a different product. I mean, it's, it's the opposite. It's written in a Spanish of nowhere. I mean, it's, it's, no, it's a nowhere Spanish. It, it has its own version of Spanish. <laughs> So um, uh, should we talk about violence? We've, we've gotten a little bit of now. <laughs> we, 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 were, we were already on the violence. We're you know? already so, on the violence. Yeah, yeah. linguistic violence. Language you know? violence. <laughs> yeah. um, fortunately, there's more to say, um, and, we, and we should. Um, so I, my question is really simple. How would you characterize the way that you approached violence in your books? and? Um, Adenia, you've already addressed this a little bit. How did you draw near to it and how did you create a distance from it? Um, and, and I know each of you have violence in such different ways in the book. So maybe if you just want to talk about that, but let's, Juan Pablo, why don't you continue? Uh, well, actually, in all, in all of my novels, in some way are, um, a reflection on what has been happening in Mexico in the last maybe 20 years, I mean, especially the drug trafficking violence and different kind of political and social uh, violences, but especially the drug trafficking violence. And the truth is that uh, I don't think that there is a uh, uh, 
an adequate way to talk about this. There are a lot of ethical issues, even moral issues, I would say, when you uh, talk about this, these violences. And, um, and, and at least my, my idea in my work has been, has to do with going through the limits of what can be said. And I remember that maybe eight or nine years ago, an American magazine asked me to write a short story uh, about the reality of violence and corruption and uh, injustice in Mexico. And, uh, and the truth is that I, keep, I kept thinking and thinking about that for weeks, because for the first time, I felt that, I, that that request was something artificial that put the issue on my mind. And I was like obligated to think about that, about how we are representing violence in Mexican literature. That is something that I'm teaching now at the university, but at the time I wasn't doing that. And uh, the, the response was that if we are in a country like Mexico, where most of the times talking about the violence, the cases of violence, for example, when we talk about what happened with the 43 students of Ayotzinapa, a very well-known case, um, we still don't know what happened. If we don't have justice, if the official version of the, of the history is always not just false, but invented, what can we do? I mean, we, the, the fiction writers. And uh, I thought that we, were, we are condemned to, to write bad. I mean, to write badly. I mean, that we can't, we can't write properly. I mean, uh, when we talk about violence, because uh, it would be artificial to, to write a book when at the end, you perfectly know what happened, who were the responsibles, who were the guilties, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in that short story that, that I wrote, it was like everything was so confused and so uh, terribly told that it was impossible to believe. And that was the origin actually of I don't expect anyone to believe me. That is something that is talking about that, that it's the, our reality, our, the Mexican reality sometimes is, is so exaggerated that you can't believe it. So even as a fiction writer, it's like, it's like a challenge. <laughs> it's like the reality is challenging you all the time. It's interesting. I think you put your mm -hmm. finger on the on the most interesting commonality between your books with the phrase invented histories. I think that mm -hmm. that I think each of your books is kind of wrestling with some version of that um, and how to uh, how to get a story, how to wring a story out of all of the layers of invention. Does that sound right? Um, Alain, do you? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I like when uh, Juan Pablo said that we are condemned to write badly. At the same time, I'm condemned to write also gladly. Uh, I find a joy or something, a kind of pleasure to like uh, expose what's happened uh, in my country, what happened to my people, what happened in Africa, what is happening right now for black people in uh, Europe, in France, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The violence I've been living within it uh, since I was like uh, seven or eight, when our president Marianne Guabi, which is the man, one of the main character 
in my novel, Marion Guavi died in 1977 on March 17. I was a kid, so I saw something happening and it was happening in my own family because the guy who was killed by the president uh, back then, by the coup d'etat, the guy who was killed, the military, the military guy, he was my own uncle. So I was like a witness in the first stage. So sometimes I surprise myself how I can deal with this kind of uh, dramatic situation. And when I'm writing, I'm preaching to laugh about what I'm writing. Because my book is about that. You are laughing about something which is very, very serious. If you are like uh, someone who is logic or something like that, you don't laugh about that. That's why I say that, yes, we are condemned to write badly, but at the same time, I add, we are condemned to write gladly as well. <laughs> Adenia, do you write gladly? Never. <laughs> it, it's a curse. I mean, I'm envious of you, Alain. How can you write gladly? I mean, I, I write, but it's like, yeah. it's not gladly. I just write it, like hard work. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's. I know the title of our session is violence, but somehow I managed not to think about it <laughs> until you <laughs> posed the question. And, <laughs> and I think this is like also this is the answer for me, probably in my experience and in like in, in the experience of Palestinian living under occupation and colonization, violence is something that you don't want to see. It's always something that you want to evade, uh, that you want to turn your face away from, because this is also mm -hmm. what allows you to continue living and, and thinking, no, I'm alive and everything is fine. So I think for me, the question through writing was never about violence, but maybe about the way to that violence or, or to the, almost like the, the dust of that violence or the, the, you know, when you have some cars coming your way, but even in, in language, like just a letter or something that falls next to you as an effect of violence, but it's never, I don't think I can, I mean, I'm hearing you, Alain, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm kind of, mm -hmm. if, if I lived what you lived or I saw what you saw, I don't mm -hmm. know if I can continue to live because it's, it's uh, frightening, you know? It's yeah. really frightening to, to, to see mm -hmm. violence or what human being is capable of doing. And for me, maybe I'm, I'm kind of an, uh, how do you say, like uh, a coward? <laughs> no. <laughs> or no, somebody so. evading. <laughs> but I really would like to, to come to that just one moment before. And if this mm. violence happens, I would like to turn my face away or to turn the language away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm not courageous to look at it in the eyes. And I think if I look at it directly, it, it's... It's, it's, um, it's almost like a, a moment of not, we'll never be able to, to utter a word or write a word, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, oh, go ahead, but what, what I uh, meant also, when I was saying that uh, we are condemned to write gladly, it, it doesn't mean that uh, we gonna write like by singing, everything is okay, life gonna be good and so on and so on. No, glad is like the pleasure of using the language of the colonizator in order to express my own situation. I'm using the French, I'm taking the French language with it's like a violence because French language beside the fact that everybody is okay that it's a poetic, romantic language, French is good. French can be also a kind of 
violent language when you are using it against the people who don't understand it quietly, which was the case of all the people from Africa who was like uh, colonized by Europe. When they went over there, they tried like to uh, erase all the African languages in order to like put just the European languages so that we're gonna be washed. We're gonna be like uh, uh, outside we are white, even if inside we are black. So the violence for a writer like me is to say that I'm proud of who I am, where I come from, and I'm gonna explain to the people, to my readers, that here is my story. My uncle was killed by a regime. In France, like uh, immigration is like, uh, uh, it's, it's one of the main topic over there. I want to like in my novel express how in our situation, we are maybe killing the humankind. This is like, uh, the pleasure of telling the story, why you are laughing, but you are laughing because you know what is happening, because you saw it before and it's happening again. You know, uh, you're mentioning, it's very like interesting this, uh, that, you know, French is exactly the language of the colonizer uh, mm -hmm. and also Spanish. And, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. And the so thing the, with Arabic, because this is the language I'm writing, is actually there is a violence against Arabic in this case. Yes, it's a, yes, it's a, yes. the violence that if you speak Arabic, because, you know, in the mm -hmm. context of Palestine, Israel, people are quite yes. similar, they almost look the same, but the minute mm -hmm. that you speak language, you, you speak Arabic, this is the moment that you are being subject to discrimination, to humiliation, to uh, violence. And this is like, mm. how do you deal with this language? This is a language like where intimacy and, uh, and playfulness and uh, childlessness is happening, but suddenly the same language can bring horror to you. Yes. So it's like, yes. it's like there's also a, a violence on the level of language. Also mm. the, the language like, you know, there was a recent law by the, Israeli government passed uh, two years ago, three years ago, like degrading or downgrading uh, Arabic to a, a special status when it was like an official language. So you feel there's also a violence on the language, it's not only on people. And so within this context, it's also your relation to this language, the playfulness, the, the gladly is so much loaded with not so much like you love the language, but it's a love mm -hmm. that is full of, of, of uh, not, not, a, not a joy. It's not like the, the not first a joy. Moment. Yeah. <laughs> Let's that, say that, that the, the joy is going to come with my African language word in which I'm putting in French. That may be the case for Juan Pablo too in Spanish, I guess. Yeah, I was thinking that the thing is how we use language. Uh, at the end, uh, I mean, yeah. language is our, our material, but this, I mean, we work with the same as the politicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, the politicians in their speeches, they use the language, but they use uh, most of the times the language to manipulate. And I think that we as a writers, we have to be very conscious of what we are doing with language. And sometimes we need to refuse to use some kind of language, specific words that are being used to manipulate or to tell a, a version of the story that we know that is not true. I mean, and that's why I, I think that uh, writing fiction, it's, always, it's not about what to tell. It is about how to tell. It's something mm. about how, something about finding the voice finding the point of view and finding the language. And, uh, and at least for me, I insist, uh, in Mexico, we have, uh, we have, have had uh, not a dictatorship, but a very long political regime of 80 years of the same political party, the PRI. Yeah. And, right. and after that, uh, 12 years of conservative uh, governments, mm -hmm. and all of them were a disaster. And they, and they create this language of words that were first uh, said by the Revolutionary Party and after that by the neoliberalists. 
And, uh, and I think that we have to be very conscious in how we are using language. And, and at least in my case, through irony, through parody, through even through cynicism, to use his own, their own words to, to reveal something, to try to, to show something. Uh, I, I know that it's, it is a commonplace, but fiction should try to, to reveal some truth, mm -hmm. some kind of truth. That's actually, <laughs> we're coming near to our end. And, and I think that, um, and I think sort of striking out on this uh, or striking forth from this idea of, um, of revealing the truth through the fictions, through these different aspects of linguistic choices, through humor, through looking away, um, as you were speaking, Adeni, I was remembering that the one part um, in the second in the second half of the book where the um, there's a building being blown up nearby the the writer, and she she just focuses on the debris on her desk. She brushes it off of her desk, but come, the debris that comes through the window, and it strikes me that that's sort of what you're talking about. The way that the novel keeps looking away. Um, it's looking at the debris coming through the window. It's sort of examining, uh, it's examining the debris. And um, I, I, I mean, again, I might have misunderstood what was happening in that moment, but um, in many ways, each of you are talking about um, these oblique ways of directly confronting um, the, the, the tyranny of invented histories. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so we're, we've actually come to the end of our panel, amazingly, mm -hmm. that just flew by. Um, I want to thank you all very much um, and again say what an absolute pleasure it was to read your books and to read them in concert and then to hear you <laughs> talking about them in concert. Um, I highly recommend it to everybody. Um, and again, um, you can purchase the books in the link below um, our talk. And um, I can't wait to read the next ones. I know they're coming in English soon, I hope. And, um, and I wanted to thank you, Juan Pablo, Adenia, Alain. Thank you very much for joining thank you. me. And thank you, Mina. For your thank, work. You, thank, thank you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.